prophets say. We're going to go back to the 10th chapter of the great book of Revelation, bearing in mind again that this is in the sixth trump. The sixth trump is sounding. The seventh trump doesn't sound until way late in the 11th chapter, not the 10th. So bear that in mind as we continue. We're going to pick it up right where we left off this morning uh, with um, verse 7 of chapter 10. The seven trumpets, we kind of know now, the voice of God announces the coming of the false one. Verse 7 of chapter 10, the great book of Revelation, and it reads, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, I'll say it again, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. I want you to make note of one word in that sentence, especially, is the word begin. It's M-E-L-L-O, mellow. And it means is about to do. He hadn't done it yet. If he hadn't sounded the seventh, we're still in the sixth, all okay? right? Got that? It's important. And verse eight. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth, meaning total control everywhere. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it. Now, what, what action did that require on your part? Give me the book. You've got to ask. You're not a baby. You're not spoon-fed. You have to ask our Father when you want truth. You have to ask our Father when you want to understand this word. Ask for it. And then he said, take it. That even taking it requires a little action on your part, okay? Take it and eat it up. That means absorb it. Ingest it. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. The truth always is. But sometimes tough love can be a little on the bitter side. Verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. Father will never mislead you if you'll do your homework. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And naturally, God's elect, after they absorb the word, are going to be delivered up. And you must prophesy before many people. The truth must be heard around the world. And God chooses people to do it. Three verses into the next chapter, the two witnesses appear. Still in the sixth trump. I, the reason I'm reminding you of this, it's important. But I wonder what we kind of maybe have overread in that, those very verses that was so important. We should have paid really close attention to it. That's when you eat the word, you've got to absorb it and think on it. There's a mystery of God. The mystery of God should not be a mystery to God's elect. You should understand. Well, how was it? Let me see, just how did he say that? Well, let's back up and let's absorb it back to the verse we started with. And in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, or he's about to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. In other words, the truth should all be there just for the taking, if you'll take the book as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Oh, oh, the prophets already know about it. He, he's already told them. So what do, what do we do? Do we get it from Mark and Matthew and John? No, 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 he said prophets. Okay. So what the prophets say is important because God gave them the mystery. Oh, where are we going to find it? You naturally are going to find it in the prophets. 
isn't that deep, okay? But if you're not careful, you can just really overread a boatload of wonderful information. So there we go, right back to the prophets. And I think probably one of the things we should do, let's take old Amos chapter three, okay? Back in the minor prophets, he's a prophet. Maybe he knows something that we should know even today. But if God told the prophets, and Amos, um, just um, after the book of Joel and the Minor Prophets, chapter 3, and let's see what God told the prophets, you know, con especially concerning you and what's going down. Chapter 3, the book of Amos, and verse 1 reads, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, that's the ten tribes, the house of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, and here he includes the house of Judah, two, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Our father gets disappointed in his children. Maybe you do yours sometimes, but our father especially and when he does, he's going to punish us. And you know something? We deserve it. And stupidity is one of the things that God abhors. It's when he puts it in the book and it's there for you to take and you don't, then he gets a little addled at you. So he said, I'm going to thump your gourd. And that's exactly what he's going to do in this chapter, verse 2. And also, he's educating you. God will always educate you and raise your, your ability to learn. Okay, verse 2. You, oh, no, I'm sorry, verse uh, 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And the answer is, of course not. They can't walk together and get along if they don't agree, if they don't see alike. Four, will a lion roar in the forest when he had no prey? How, how can he brag about something if he hadn't caught it? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? He's got nothing to cry about. Okay. And five, can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is set for him? If you don't have a trap, how can a bird get caught in it? You see what God's doing to you? You won't pay close attention. Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? No effect without a cause. You cannot expect any effect without a cause. So you had better be well know what the cause of our Father is. It's to love and save his children, to have them know how to walk together, to have them know what it is he expects of them. How do you learn that from the book? The little book he insisted you read. No effect without a cause. Always remember that because God has a purpose and a cause for everything, the way he created it. The only reason you see some things happening without a cause and some effect is if men go against God's nature. That will do it. Verse 6, shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord God hath not done it? And of course, again, no effect, no cause. Verse 7, now listen, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveal his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And there you have it. He has told them. They know the secret. And all you have to do is go to the prophets and understand. Verse 8, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? When you know and understand the word of God, how can you not speak that word? How can you not share it? You have to. It'll, it, it will explode within you if you have that truth. You don't sit on it. You don't hide it under a bushel. You share it. And when it is so beautiful, especially in these end times, 
So naturally, when God foretells everything, then all you have to do is read. It's all written. No need to not understand the mystery of our Father. Nine, publish it in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria and behold the great tumults in the midst thereof and the oppressed in the midst thereof. Now, the Septuagint doesn't have uh, uh, Ashdod here. It has the Assyrian, and that is the, sub, uh, the subject. It was the Assyrian that took the ten nations, ten tribes, northern tribes, captive. Therefore, we're talking about it. We're talking about Egypt. Have you looked at Egypt lately? They, they murder Christians there. They burn Christian churches big time. Assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria. You look, look at the house, those 10 tribes of Israel. Just look at them. And behold the great tumults in the midst thereof and the oppression in the midst thereof. Well, I wonder what that could mean. A nation that is so blessed and they allow somebody to take the helm that drives it right into the mud. Okay. I mean, unemployment. I mean, people barely being able to make it. And certainly, do you think God knows it? You bet he does. It was written a long time ago. And God blesses those that love him and follow him. Verse 10, for they know not to do right, saith the Lord. Talking about Israel, they don't. What, what, ask them what the word of God says. Ask them what the little book says. They'll laugh at you. They'll say, you, you, we don't know. We need a teacher. Well, uh, there's a teacher down there. Go see what he says. You're going to fly away. That's what the teacher said. That's not what the book says. Okay. So you've got to be very careful. Don't be misled. For they know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. That means right at the top of the thing they steal, mislead. Verse 11, therefore thus saith the Lord God, an adversary, that adversary is the Antichrist. The Antichrist there shall be an even um, round about the land and he shall bring down the strength from thee and thy palaces shall be spoiled. When he shows up, he takes over. And do you know something? People will let him. They will run after him because they don't know any better. Probably he's telling them, I'm gonna fly you away. And they say, oh, I've heard that before. Twelve, thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs, or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of the bed and Damascus in a couch, living pretty plush. But there are so few shepherds that know truth that all they're able to do is just to pull a few, a few scattered compared to the billions on this earth today that will take the time to listen to truth to understand what the little book says. The prophets were told long ago, the prophets say, eat the word, absorb it. Don't be confused. Verse 13, hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob. Say the Lord God to, said the Lord God to the host of, uh, to the God of hosts that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, when I, when I come to thump his gourd, I will also visit the altars of Bethel. Bethel in the Hebrew tongue means house of God. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. He's not too happy with Bethel. He's not too happy with what's called the house of God. 15, this verse will tell you why. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house and the house of ivory shall perish and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Your wealth is going to go south. So I'm, I'm going to see that your, your fancy living 
we're, we're going to bring you down a notch or two. I wonder if that sounds familiar anyway. And, but there you have it. The prophets. Well, what's another prophet? Well, well, I'll tell you what. Go back to chapter 1 of this book of Amos. We're going to just spend a minute here. See if this might sound familiar to you. Verse 5 of chapter 1. I will break also the bar of Damascus. That's Syria. And cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Avon. That's the open field. And him that, behold, that holdeth the scepter. That's the leader. From the house of Eden. And the prince of Syria shall go into captivity unto Kerr. That means the fortress. Saith the Lord. He's not happy with Syria. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, God won't put up with three, okay? And for four, you overdone it. Four transgressions, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. That's to say Rush or Russia. I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof, and I will cut off the inhabitant of Ashdod, and him that holdeth the scepter in Ashkelon, this is the west, the, oh, there on, uh, above Gaza, and I will turn mine hand against Ekron, that's torn out by the roots, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord God. And it goes on with Tyrus, he numbs them, numbers them off. You read about it every day in the newspapers. You see it on television. You see it happening right now. It's in the book. And God foretold us. He said the whole mystery is right there. And it builds up to the coming of the adversary. That's where you come in to reach your people. You know, sometimes I can't reach your people, but you can. They will hear you. And that's what you want to give them is the book. But you must take the book, absorb it, digest it. Now let's really get down to the nitty gritty. Another prophet, good old Daniel, okay? Good old Daniel, we want to go about chapter eight. I've, I've lost my notes here, but I didn't need them anyway. So they're right behind me here. If I need them, I'll go to them. I don't. Okay. Chapter 8, and I, what I want to call your attention to is verse 2. Daniel's having a vision here, and it has to do with the end times. That's you. It's in the book. You see, God told the prophets what's going to happen. It's the mystery. You're supposed to understand it because you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Let's understand what the geographical location is. It's very, very important. Chapter 8, verse 2. Uh, well, let's take one. In the third year of the king Belshazzar, that's the last king of Babylon, okay? Not the very last, because the very last is the Antichrist, got it? A vision appeared unto me, even to me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Shushan, in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision, and I was by the river, Uli. Now, it's very important that you know where Uli is, because that's where this vision was given. And that geographical location is very important. Now, if you're like me, probably it just doesn't come to your mind right real quick, all right? But let me tell you then where Uli is. <clears throat> At the head of the Persian Gulf, when the, where the Euphrates and the Tigris run into the Persian Gulf. The Uli is a little river that runs into the Tigris out of where? Iran. We're talking about Iran, okay? And it's very important concerning this prophecy. Skip now, now that we have a geographical location, which is important, it's just as important as when you were told to go to the Euphrates and Kadim in the Hebrew tongue. That doesn't mean look to the east. It means go to the Euphrates and look east. Well, what do you do? What do you see when you go to the Euphrates and look east? You see Iran. You see Turkey. You see Afghanistan. You see Iraq and parts of it. 
Okay. Verse 19 in chapter 8. Daniel didn't quite understand this, and the angel came along, lifted him up, and now he's going to explain it, and you don't have to go through the first part because you already have it memorized. E any one of you could quote it, I'm sure. Okay, so, but to understand the translation, let's pick it up in verse 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. That applies to you, my friend. That's exactly what he's talking about. What transpires at the end of this age? You're here. Even the prophets wanted to live at this time because it's exciting, it's vivacious. It's God's love on those that will follow him, that will take the book, that will absorb it and live it and share it with others because they love the brethren. Verse 20, the ram which thou sawest having two horns or two kings of Medio Persia. That's Iran today, you understand? That's the old Medio Persia is Iran today and that general geographical area. That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grisa and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. This word Grisha is Javon, and it means, um, it means um, hot and active. Uh, you should know who's hot and active because he's getting practiced up for the hot place, okay, some of his people. 22, now that being broken, his first standing out in leadership, Whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not of his power. Well, I wonder whose power that is. I wonder what that could have to do with four demons bound, turned loose at the Euphrates. I mean, that's where we're at here. And, and four kingdoms happen not, not by the media of Persia power, not by Iran's power, but by something far more satanic. For those four angels that were cast out of when the Euphrates was opened at the sixth trump, and that's what we're in here, are evil. And they shall establish and lead. Their names probably won't be prominent, but the wickedness that they will bring forth will be paramount. I suppose you read about some of it. You know, cutting heads off and blowing children up isn't really my cup of tea. It's not a Christian's cup of tea. But whose cup of tea is it? Look at it. Verse 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of furious countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. That's where the Antichrist appears. He, out of those four stands this one. He's the one that sent them. He's the one that controls them. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. It's the total satanic power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Hey, he's taken over because people are going to think he is Christ. You, you want to get set for that. He is going to take over. They're going to follow him like, like a, a herd of, of um, geese, one right in a row, following him, saying, he's here, he's here. Because they haven't been taught. They didn't take the book. They didn't absorb the little book. And the end comes. He doesn't take it by force. Didn't you hear the words? He said he comes in peacefully. And prosperously they want him he takes over because they drag him in they're crazy about him because they're deceived where did those evil spirits come from we just read in in the book of Revelation that I said what is it that's coming out of their mouth blowing smoke okay that's all and people they love it 
when, when he does that. Why? Because he comes in prosperously. All your troubles are over. 25, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace, don't overlook that, by peace shall destroy many. Many that claim to be good Christians are going to fall right in with him. He shall also stand up against the prince of, uh, the prince of p- princes, but he shall be broken without hand. When Christ is ready to snap his old head, he's gone. Okay? When he's ready to wound his head into the pit, he's going. But whatever you do, how important it is that you listen to the prophets and not be deceived. He's coming. We're coming to that time. We're in that sixth trump already. I mean, the swarmers let us know that. There's very little doubt about that. Either it's the strongest type we've ever seen in our life, or you're looking at it, and man, does it look real. And it's something that watchmen are supposed to watch and be very aware of. Verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick. Certain days afterward I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. You're supposed to. Daniel didn't, but you are today, because this is the end. Daniel will continue, I'm sorry, yeah, Daniel will continue on, and he'll remember the 70 years of Jeremiah. And then he will think for a moment, and he will remember the 70 weeks that comes up, covers right up to the crucifixion. And then there's a gap theory for that 70th week. You'll read of it in chapter 9, verse 27, the book of Daniel. What does it say? I'm going to read it in English, and then I'm going to translate part of it in Hebrew for you. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's the morning and the evening offering. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, that's the end, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. It's the desolator. This is why when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, it's a mistranslation. Moffat got it right. It should be when you see the desolator, that's the Antichrist, stand in Judea, claiming to be Christ, you're at the end. That's what Christ taught there. What this really says in the Hebrew, on the, you with companion Bibles, it does it for you. It, it, it says that he, he comes on the wings of des, the, the desolate, and he is the desolator. And he is the one that stands in the holy place claiming to be the God of all. You know something? Those miracles that he performs are astounding to someone that isn't learned. And to conquer our people, you know, it's never been done before. Stop and think about it. This nation has never been defeated. But he's going to take it over peacefully using the four hidden dynasties, that's religion, political, economic, and and so forth. He's going to do it. And that's when you come in. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Now, uh, how precious it is to know our Father. There is one little prophet, maybe one we should go to. Why? Because his name is Nahum, and it means comforter. And the Lord Jesus Christ is our true comforter. And do you know what he tells us there? He lets us know what happens to the people that come against Christians. And I think maybe that we will close with going to Nahum. And um, Nahum is right after Micah in the Minor Prophets. Very short little book, okay? Very short book. But it's, it's do, you, do you know where Nineveh is? See, this, this prophecy, again, geographically, it's important. The Assyrian that took the house of Israel captive. Its headquarters were Nineveh. 
Nineveh, well, where is it located? Well, it's located just a little bit east of the Tigris. Well, isn't that something? That's Iran again. All these prophecies are pointing towards Iran geographically. That shouldn't be a big surprise, okay? So having said that, this is how God destroys it and brings it into check. And you have a part in that. Verse 9 of chapter 3, the great book of Nahum, the prophets say, this is what this prophet says, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength. This, this Iran and others, they, they get their power from there. And it was infinite, put, that's Libya. And Lubin, those are the migratory ones, were thy helpers. They're all over the place, swarming. Yet was she carried away, she went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of the streets, and they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Just watch them go down one after the other. You've seen it. It's not a pretty sight. It's not a pretty sight what's happening to children that put on explosive vests and blow their guts out, you know? That's not, that's not war. That's, that's not, there's no honor in that. How could anything so demonic come to be? Well, maybe four demons have something to do with it. Maybe four angels that are demonic have something to do with it or cut loose on the Euphrates. Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid, thou shalt seek strength because of the enemy. And who is the enemy of, of the captors of our people? You are. God is the enemy of those that come against the children of God. I don't care where you are, what, what um, belief, as long as it is God's word. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs, if they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Do you know what that's talking about? Do you really? It should remind you of a scripture. You don't have to turn there. Let me do it for you. Um, okay, Revelation chapter 6. Whoops. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. Let me read it to you. Revelation 12 and 6. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Remember what I told you about the sixth seal? And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Thirteen, listen, this is why we came here. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth like lightning. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, that's what we're talking about, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And so it is. We're talking about the sixth trump, the sixth seal, and what transpires there, how God thumps the enemy through you. Verse 13. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. This is our enemy. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. You have to, the reason gates are left wide open, there's no security and there's not really any trained military. It's just kind of helter-skelter everywhere, swarming and people running and not disciplined and certainly not good warriors at all. Verse 14, draw, speaking to the enemy, draw thee waters for the siege, fortify thy strongholds, go into clay and tread the martyr, make strong the brick kelp. In other words, you better, you better beef it up. You know why? They're going to lose. There's not anything they can build that can outlast God. 15, there shall the fire devour thee. And God is that consuming fire. The sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Underline it. Make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as the locust. 
This word locust is, is Arabi. The same word as Arab, basically. Do you understand what the canker worm is? You know, we've been talking about swarming. The canker worm is the devourer. It's the third stage of the locust. In other words, you move from swarmer here to devour in this canker worm. So, and they're populating. In other words, the plot thickens. Prophecy concludes. The end comes. And you're reading about it. It is the third stage. There's only one left. It's the consumer. 16. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. You claim to be greater than God. The canker worm spoileth and fleeth away. The devourer. He despoils everything. He can't accomplish anything. Conquers by destruction. You know, it's a beautiful thing when we have Peace Corps that go to certain places that need water and dig wells and train people how to pump fresh water to not be sick. And some people go and blow people up. Who do you choose? Where do you study? The prophets, God told them a long time ago, have you read them? It's very, it's very um, wonderful and, and so good to understand the Word of God, especially when you have a picture of it every day in front of you as life on the east of the Euphrates continues to roll. Verse 17, thy crowned are the locust. This word crowns, as you know from, from the New Testament, Revelation chapter 9, is turbans. Your little old turbans just blow in the wind. And the word locust is Arabi. And thy captains as the great grasshoppers. You know, he's saying here, who's leading you is the first stage. The, the, the word for grasshopper is gob. And, and gob means a, a boar. It, it's the larva. Got a hard shell around it. You couldn't penetrate it hardly. Wearing their little old turbans, which camp in the hedges in the cold day, but when the sun arises, they flee away in their places, not knowing where they are. You know, that's the way fallen angels operate. Now you see them, now you don't. Cause the mischief and fade away. Hide in the hedge, you don't see them unless you've read the book, unless you know what the prophets say. And the prophets tell you, you're on that hour, watch it. Don't be deceived. You're a child of God, act like it. Absorb, eat it, the truth, and live it. Verse 18, the shepherds, thy shepherds slumber, not our shepherds. This is the would-be teachers of the world. O king of Assyria. And Assyria, again, that's the, that's the group that took the ten tribes captive and now is made up of Syria and Iran. The, thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains. And no man gathereth them. You know, they really don't care. I, I would not want to belong to a society like that. You know, um, I, I don't have to be descriptive about what happens there. You see pictures of it every day. It isn't pretty. Okay. I, I have a very difficult time understanding how someone could feel they were doing something heavenly by strapping on a, a, an explosive belt and getting on a bus with school children and killing them all, blowing them up, blowing them to pieces. What did it say? Your children also are dashed in pieces back in verse 10. It's happening every day and it's a shame and it's a disgrace. 
under the eyes of the living God, and he's getting tired of it. Verse 19, there is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap thy hands over thee, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? New York City, Twin Towers, own and own, over and over. Blow them up, kill them, cut their heads off, do something honorable. Okay. Take out this leader, take out that leader, and let the brotherhood take over. Now, wait a minute. Who's the brotherhood? You better be finding out. Okay? You should know already because they've got four leaders and they're pretty sharp because they're not necessarily natural. They're supernatural. But you are better than that because you've got the book. You've got the little book and God said, my mystery, I gave it to the prophets. And that's what the prophets say. Beloved, we could go on and on and on covering the prophets that warn daily. But it's all the same story. It's the mystery of God. The cause is this. Father wants you to know, he said, it's time for the false one to be cast down. It's time. And he's going to be. This world cannot go on the way it is. So God is calling a people. He called some good ones. I look at you and I wonder, you know. <laughs> that, there you are, okay. I'll ride with you, you know. I, and I, I praise God for you that you love truth. And um, I want to say my poor, my Oh, Marine Corps buddy that usually comes, he passed away this year. We lost him. Those old, us old Korean combat veterans from up at the Chosan Reservoir were, were getting a few years on us. Now, I'm, I probably would be getting a little weaker myself, but God won't let me, okay? <laughs> he says we got work to do. So, but I... I do know how to battle where it's wave after wave after wave, and they're coming. Be ready for it. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. Thank you, Father, for the mighty word that you give us, Father. We bless you and praise you for it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. This is why you must always check a teacher out this one or any other, but check them out in God's Word. That's what they're supposed to be teaching, not some quarterly or something else. Joe from Arkansas, uh, a person has raised an American flag with the face of Mr. Obama uh, where the stars should be. I, I know the implication of, of this evil act uh, your thoughts, please, sir. Well, my thoughts are kind of like the vets that showed up there that same day. And the vet said, either you take it down or we do. That's the way I feel about it. It had to come down because it's, uh, it is, you know, many of us have shed blood for that flag. I have. 
and we take it very seriously. It's symbolic. It's a standard of this nation free. And when you put somebody's picture to desecrate it, then that is an abomination. Billy from Arkansas, did Jesus as a young boy know he would be growing up to be Jesus Christ? Did he know he was special? Well, of course he did. Uh, uh, Isaiah, you know, he was the living word among us. And what does the word say? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. A virgin shall conceive, shall bear a child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted as God with us. And, and naturally, he knew. Why? Because he was God in that, in that dimension that God would give him as Savior. That was the office of Savior. And, and your documentation for it is when he was 12 years old. He, he uh, went to Jerusalem with his family. And he ended up away from the family down, I mean, right at the head muckety-duck of the synagogue and the Sanhedrin. And he was teaching them Bible. He was stressing points of the Bible and they were amazed that this 12 year old could quote and teach God's word the way he was. And how little did they know but before them, in this 12-year-old, they had the Word of God. It became flesh and walked among us. So. Uh, okay, Sarah from Minnesota. Can you explain to me the four horns that scattered Judah and the craftsmen that came to lift their horns against Judah in Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 through 21? What are the horns? The horns are the four hidden dynasties. They're bad. They're the power. Horns are always symbolic of power. And these are the powers of Satan or that he utilizes to deceive people. We call them the four hidden dynasties. What, what that consists of is political, educational, ec the economy, and education. And, and so it is, That's, but most of all, religion. And Satan uses the pulpit to deceive many people. I think if you've ever listened to some people that never quite get around to facts and God's word, you found that out. The carpenters that follow this, and I'm going to say that that's what the craftsmen is what you're calling them, are the ones that fashion the um, the um, procurement or the mending of the four hidden dynasties. And this brings forth the stone that has the seven eyes, which are symbolic of the 7,000 of God's elect. And when you continue on into the fourth chapter, certainly um, you see the two anointed ones, uh, the sons of oil, in the closing verse of chapter 4 of Zechariah which are the two witnesses. Okay, we have, uh, this would be uh, Claudia from Texas. I have a question. Could you please give me the chapter and verse where I can find out where God says, remind me of my promises? I thought it was Matthew chapter 24. Thank you so much. No, 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 not. It's in the Old Testament. You find it in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26. I'll say it again. Isaiah 43, verse 26. God, God knows his promises. He just wants you to remind him so that he knows you've read them and you claim them. And then he can justify you. It means you've done your homework and he's ready to bless you. Joe from Georgia. <clears throat> Reading your Bible, is this good works? Of course it is. It prepares you to be able to help others and it strengthens your own character, and it brings blessings to you. What happens to our home when, when Christ returns? Will it be burned up? N not necessarily. We go to a different dimension, and uh, the dimension of uh, us that the spirit, your spirit body is in. <clears throat> we will have all new homes at that time in a different dimension, but still right here on earth. 
Linda from Michigan, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the dead in Christ will rise first. Does this mean that people will do which, which do not hear Jesus? Uh, I'm confused. No, it, it means that um, the dead in Christ have already risen, like I explained just earlier. You'll read it in, in, not in the 16th verse, back up to the 13th verse and pick up the subject so you'll understand what the 16th verse is talking about. Naturally, if those, if Christ rose from the dead and you either believe that or you're not a Christian, okay, then you have to believe that all that are dead or asleep have risen also. Then how can, the, how can those in Christ rise first? Because they're already gone. Okay. It's really very simple. And, uh, but you have to go back to 13, pick up the subject and the object, and it'll all fall right in place for you. Uh, this would be um, Forrest from Kentucky. I have a question. Where, let's, let me see here. I, I really enjoy your teaching. I am an early riser. Your program is, is uh, the reason that I am. Uh, I am your age, also was in Korea. The only fighting that I did was with a guy in my outfit. I don't know what part of Korea you were in, but that wasn't the way I found it to be. Okay, but, but you were fortunate. God bless you for that. I have a question. Where will I be immediately after death? You'll be in paradise. Also, will I be able to know and talk to the grandparents that died before? You, you will know them. And it is in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 20 through 25, documents that we know our relatives. And those that are on the wrong side of the gulf, we can even help them a little bit. By we can't die, we can't uh, overcome for them, but we can discipline them to get their act together. Uh, Karen Ann from Maryland. What is the one unforgivable sin? Thank you so much for your time. You are so welcome. The one unforgivable sin you will find in Luke chapter 12, verse 10. And it cannot be committed until after the Antichrist appears on earth. That is the sin you're not to pray for somebody to be forgiven for, to intercede for them. That is when one of God's elect refused to stand against Satan as the Antichrist. You refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you. I personally do not think that will happen. I know God's elect pretty well. Their problem is not um, holding their peace. Their, peace. their trouble usually is talking too much. Okay, they, they hate Satan and they're ready to face him. Ron from Oregon, question. When we, get, when we go to heaven, will we know the people by sight that made this life troublesome? And will we have or show our feelings we had then towards them? I think not, but would like to know for sure. Well, read, read Luke chapter 16. We all go to paradise. That's to say the good, the bad, the ugly. Okay. But the good go on one side of paradise, and the bad, the ugly actors, go on the opposite side of paradise, and there is a huge gulf uncrossable between so you will not be able during the time in paradise to talk to them. They can see you and you can see them. But the millennium is when we take names and kick dragon. Okay, That's when we, hopefully, it isn't to condemn them that we will be talking to them in the millennium because it is to save them, to let them know. You know, they also are God's children. Many of them had no opportunity to learn the truth while they were in the flesh body. This is God's way of giving everybody an equal opportunity in a spirit body without the hang up of the flesh to know and see the truth and to overcome. And your job, as it is written in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, is to be a priest with Christ for a thousand years. What does a priest do? He teaches. He or she teaches. 
Uh, Bill from Alabama, and uh, this is a, an old retired police officer. I don't think anyone has asked this question. I have a relative who is very active member of a church that teaches the false flyaway doctrine. I want to give some money to my relative, but I know for a fact she will give 10% to her church if I do. Since I know the truth, there is no rapture and I know my 10% of the money I give to my, to my um, relative will go to her false teaching church. Will I myself be held accountable by the Father according to the, uh, the teachings of John chapter 10? Um, actually, I would be a little more concerned with the teachings in the little epistle of John, the second one just before the book of Revelation, the second epistle of John. If you as much as wish them Godspeed, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. Um, <clears throat> what you would do, Billy, is you would, if you decide to give her the sum, put strings to it. You cannot use it to, as an offering to your church, otherwise you ha she would reject the whole thing. That clears you and hopefully she would not lie to you. Otherwise, God would see to it that it was very hurtful. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes His day. When, when you study His letter, it makes God's day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. <clears throat> Most important, though, listen to me, listen good. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yahshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.